call this uh, committee hearing of the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee to order. Um, we are going to begin today uh, by uh, recognizing Chair Tomasoni. He has a new technology and wishes to address the committee. Chair Tomasoni. Today our hearing involves the University of Minnesota and the decision to discontinue certain sports. Unfortunately, the U of M won't be here to give us their reasons for this action. We will be hearing from various individuals who have been negatively impacted by the decision. I should note that the vote of the regents was 7 to 5. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the testimony. Thank you, Chair Tomasoni. And members, uh, that's we are here today to uh, hear some testimony from the three sports programs from the University of Minnesota that were canceled. Um, I first heard about this when a, a local mom uh, reached out. Uh, her son is, was a hopeful to uh, make it to the university gymnastics program, and in the coming weeks following that, uh, I've met with a number of people from those programs. Um, hearing their story, and that's the reason we're here today, just as Senator Thomas Sony alluded to. Um, unfortunately, during the process, uh, the members of these three sports programs felt like they were not listened to, were not given an opportunity um, to be a part of the process. And I believe uh, we all deserve to have our stories heard, and that is the reason we are here today, to, to give them that opportunity to tell their stories to get that out to the public and uh, begin a discussion and hopefully be part of a process to join with the university to move forward and see if there are opportunities to bring these programs and others uh, back to the University of Minnesota. So with that, we will begin the testimony and we will begin with Ms. Anne Marie Rogers. Ms. Rogers, please identify yourself for the record and sure. begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman, uh, Mr. Rarick, and esteemed Senators. My name is Anne-Marie McNamara-Rogers. Thank you for the opportunity today to outline what transpired in 2020 when the U of M Board of Regents voted to eliminate men's tennis, gymnastics, and indoor track on the recommendation of the Athletic Department. We hope the legislature will take a look into how this decision was made, looking at the lack of transparency in the process, help advocate for the student athletes at the U, and hopefully reinstate these sports. The biggest advocates for student athletes at a school should be those in the athletic director's office, and we'd like to see that at our university. My family and I have a long history of support for the University of Minnesota going back 70 plus years. My dad, Bob McNamara, and his brother, Pinky, played football at the U in the 50s. The U provided scholarships to these two poor kids from Hastings, and they spent the rest of their lives paying back the school with donations, service, advocacy for student athletes. In fact, my uncle Pinky was a regent at the University of Minnesota. In 2002, men's and women's golf and men's gymnastics were threatened with elimination. Bob and Pinky, along with athletic director Joel Maturi and other alumni, leapt into action and saved those sports through donor fundraising and team teamwork together. The AD and the alumni worked together because they all cared about saving the opportunities these sports provided for students. Of note is that spring, the golf team, the team that was on the chopping block, won the national championship. This is the national championship ring given to my dad by the golf team that won the NCAA title that year. They thanked him for fighting for them and not giving up. There was no common advocacy leading up to the vote like there was 20 years later, earlier. Instead, it involved alumni, coaches, and the athletes themselves in an impossible fight against the athletic department and president. One of the worst things about this whole ordeal was the complete lack of collaboration that ran antithetical to the decades of collaborative spirit that was the hallmark of our university. Now, a brief history of the timeline of events leading up to and following the vote to eliminate the sports. It's important to note that the budget deficits and the attitude towards non-rev sports predate the present administration. A portion of the deficit facing the athletic department was the result of then AD Norwood Teague's Athletic Village Project, which cost an estimated $166 million in 2013 and has yet to be fully paid off. Teague commented publicly that the university's focus would be increasingly on revenue generating sports and that non-rev Olympic sports would play a lesser role. More concerning, than the Athletic Village debt service was the inference that Olympic sports were not a priority. 
In spring of 2020, in the early stages of COVID, President Gable publicly communicated that she had asked all university departments to review their budgets in the face of expected budget shortfalls. On May 9th, reports began appearing that the athletic department was faced with a significant debt, and Athletic Director Coyle said everything was on the table to address the issue. After that, up until the subsequent public communication of his plan on September 10th, 2020, no conversation or engagement was held with the affected parties. They didn't even know they were the affected parties. They were blindsided. At one point, it was stated that the men's sports were being cut in part to satisfy Title IX. But did you know that leading up to this, as many as 40 women's roster spots were eliminated? That fact was not publicized at the time. While the Title IX compliance flag was waived, this dishonesty played a large role in influencing key regions' votes. In fact, as the rule is written, we seem to be in compliance with Title IX before the cuts took place. At another point, it was stated the budget was the reason for the cuts. As the last couple of years have unfolded, that doesn't make much sense either. In an open letter on September 10th to University of Minnesota Athletic Community, the Athletic Department finally publicly outlined its solution to address the debt crisis. A projected debt of approximately $75 million was now anticipated and included the Athletes Village debt. The solution on the table was to eliminate men's indoor and outdoor track, men's gymnastics, and tennis. Estimated savings was to be $1.7 million of recurring costs. Also announced were some administration cuts amounting to an additional $1.3 million for the coming year. This was to be followed by requesting a loan to cover the rest, $75 million. The September 10th announcement set into motion stakeholders' efforts to get the facts of the story out. A final Regent vote on the issue was set for October 10th, 2020 at the next Regent meeting. Disappointing was that a decision of this magnitude amidst a flurry of confusion around Title IX numbers and financials was given only 30 days for public airing, no town halls, and no further explanations. In regards to engaging with the Athletic Department and President's Office, I want to be clear that they did agree to meet with tennis supporters. These meetings seem to be just checking a box, and they did not engage in any meaningful problem solving or collaboration. They did not accept numerous meetings, numerous requests with other affected sports, despite many requests. Sorry about that. The coaches and athletes were notified about the demise of their sports only minutes before the announcement on September 10th. When the coaches were notified, they were told not to bother trying to raise any money and that the decision was final. When the teams raised money anyway, their substantial pledges, donations in excess of $4 million, were rejected. We were shocked and appalled to be met with a complete dismissal of any collaborative problem solving when we came to the table with solutions and had been told the problem was largely financial. In the aftermath of the October 10th vote by the Board of Regents, some very concerning information came to light about the internal governance processes of the Board regarding this vote. It has since been reported that throughout the evening of October 9th, 2020, the vice chair of the board called several regions who were reportedly undecided to try to influence their vote at the last minute on an under the table new proposal to remove outdoor track from the public resolution and cut the proposed eliminated sports to three. The rationale for retaining outdoor track was in part due to concerns regarding protecting the diversity of then current track athletes. What wasn't fairly represented to the board or public was that cutting indoor track is the same as cutting outdoor track. Few quality runners will come to Minnesota in the future without maintaining the proper pipeline of an indoor and outdoor season. A few of the regents balked at the change in the proposal that happened literally in the dark of night and was presented after the meeting had started, which is not meeting protocol. When one regent motioned for a delay in the vote so there would be time to discuss this non-consulted change resolution, his motion was voted down and the new proposal, just minutes old, ended up passing. The board voted 7 to 5 in favor of the fateful proposal. Jael Karendi, then student representative to the Board of Regents, spoke during the meeting, making an impassioned, eloquent plea for reconsideration of the proposal on the table on behalf of the students. She was summarily ignored. In fact, every time this issue was raised by students and student athletes themselves, they were either denied the chance to speak or their input was ignored. Most disheartening was the lack of advocacy for those student athletes affected. The vote by the majority of the board ignored the voices of thousands in the Gopher community and across the state who were pleading for the regents to do the right thing. The majority of the board didn't do their job by failing to listen to the public they supposedly represent. A review of athletic department revenues and operating expenses in required NCAA financial reports raises questions over the validity of the department facing a trend of deficits. As COVID restrictions eased, revenue sports resumed, and the actual debt crisis went down considerably from the 75 million to roughly 20 million. 
At one point, the athletic department, months after cutting the sports and saving roughly $1.7 million, asked for a loan from the university for $21.5 million. It seems a loan of this size could easily have covered the cost of the three sports. Between 2019 and 2021, the football salary pool increased by 3.1 million, and just weeks ago, further salary increases and extensions were given to football coaches, volleyball coaches, our athletic director, and the president of the university. That is money that could have kept our sports, but instead of going to students, that money went to the people who were instrumental in cutting the sports. Think about that. It's ironic that the raises given by the Board of Regents to the athletic director and president nearly matched the dollar amounts saved by cutting the three sports. October 10th, 2020 was a sad day. A decision was reached permanently in a closed process. It was reached based on shifting information with little interest in listening to others' ideas, including those of the students. It pained us to see the chain of events that killed opportunities for these athletes and tarnished our university. As one regent put it on the day of the vote, this was not our best moment. We would most certainly agree. Back in 2002, men's golf and gymnastics was threatened with elimination. The athletic department advocated for athletes. This time that was not the case. That's why we are here today. I showed you this 2002 national championship ring earlier, which my father wore proudly the rest of his life. Someone once said to me, I didn't know your dad was so interested in golf. It wasn't about golf to him. He was fiercely protective of opportunities for student athletes, and he knew firsthand that these opportunities can be life-changing. Let's follow his lead again. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and esteemed senators, for shining light on this problem. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now I'll turn it over to Ava Hill, current track athlete. Yeah, members, we will uh, get through this first group of testifiers. Uh, testifiers, please stay close. We may have some questions uh, for you following. Our next testifier is Ms. Ava Hill. Ms. Hill, please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ava Hill. I'm currently a student athlete on the University of Minnesota women's track team. I went to high school at Masabi East in northern Minnesota. I'm here today because I care about the Gopher sports cuts that occurred in the fall of 2020. As an in-state student, the ability to come to the University of Minnesota to continue my education and athletic career fulfilled a dream. Growing up in Aurora, I was motivated every day by the prospects of becoming a Gopher and competing at the highest level. Back at home, there's a great sense of pride in what my community calls the U. Even today, when I go out for a run at home, people recognize me and shout encouragement, making it clear that they are proud of me and the university that I represent. I went to a very small school, and the university in comparison can be a little intimidating. But I hope in some small way I have been a trailblazer for kids in my area in the greater Iron Range who might have otherwise not considered the U. And I suspect this is also true for our male track athletes who come from many different communities full of kids that they are proud to be role models for. The cuts that occurred in the fall of 2020, specifically the cutting of men's indoor track, had an impact on our team. And I say our team because in 2019, the men's and women's track teams were joined. Today, every time I travel with our women's team to indoor meets, we are reminded that part of our team is left behind. All of us on the women's team acknowledge that we have, we have earned all of these racing opportunities, and we know that the men have too, but they now have an extra hurdle to go over and trying to compete against other men's teams who enjoy the liberty of having an indoor season. Without an indoor season, our men's team will suffer from a recruiting standpoint as well as a competitive standpoint. I'm also acutely aware that women's roster spots were cut in the fall of 2020. I wonder how many women like me and other towns around the state will lose the chance to be role models in their communities because officials at the University of Minnesota decided that there was not room for them. <coughs> Long term, the women's track team fears for the competitiveness of the men's team. We know that they are just as talented as those who get to compete at Big Ten and national meets, but the opportunity to earn these spots at these meets has been unjustly taken away. I suspect the Gopher women's gymnastics and tennis teams feel the same disappointment as the men who compete in their sports have had their opportunities stripped away as well. If you don't remember anything I've said today, I hope you will remember this. Kids have big dreams, and the decisions made in the fall of 2020 impact young athletes who dream of attending the University of Minnesota 
and who are capable of becoming positive role models for the people in their communities if they are given the chance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Our next testifier is Mr. Yaya Medar. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Senators. My name is Yaya Madar. Uh, I attended Mounds Park Academy, and I'm a student athlete on the track team at the University of Minnesota. I was born and raised in Minnesota and chose the university because I wanted to stay close to home and attend a school that offered a broad range of majors while also having the opportunity to continue my athletic career. It was a big deal for someone from a high school as small as mine to pursue athletics at the Division I stage, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to compete at such a high level. I take pride in being disciplined and dedicated both in the classroom and on the track because as Division I student athletes, we're role models to the younger generation. Athletics has taught me countless valuable lessons that I apply in every aspect of my life. Like so many athletes, I have understood the connection between hard work and results and that accountability is essential in being a successful student athlete. Most importantly, I'm part of a team that preaches a winning culture and I've been able to observe leadership and teamwork firsthand, which I believe is more valuable than being taught about it in a classroom. I'm certain that these experiences will follow me for the rest of my life and will be useful regardless of what career path I may end up choosing. Like many of my fellow teammates, I was surprised, shocked, and disappointed with the decision to eliminate indoor track. We were very confused by the decision, and the explanation was even more confusing. There was a sense of hopelessness and uncertainty for our future as we tried to find the best way to let our voices be heard. While we did have immense support from our women's team, and who were also having roster spots reduced, as well as the other teams that were cut, we were still missing support from the athletic administration. My teammates and I felt like we didn't have any support from the authority figures that could influence this decision. If there's one thing I hope you remember from me, it's that cutting these teams don't come without a consequence. While it's easy for our team to be seen as just a small number of the many athletic programs the university has to offer, remember that we are people too. We are people working to develop our life skills and the experiences we make outside the classroom are just as important as those in it. I can't emphasize how hard we have worked and how much time we have put into each of our sports for it to be taken away so abruptly. Walk in our shoes before you make decisions that deeply impact our lives. It isn't just those who are cut that are affected, but families, friends, and everyone who has supported these teams are impacted as well. Everyone on our track team, and I'm sure on the tennis and gymnastics team, knows that we deserve to be heard. Please fight for us. I promise we are worth it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next testifier is Mr. Mark Fu. Please identify yourself for the record and uh, begin with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Mark Fu. I was born in Minneapolis. I am a senior at Minnetonka High School. I started gymnastics when I was two years old. My mom was pregnant with my two siblings, and, I, and since I was very naughty, she decided to put me in a community gymnastics program to keep me busy. <laughs> From there, they recommended my parents to go to a private club and train seriously for gymnastics. I've been at Mini Hops Gymnastics since I was four years old. I trained in the same gym as Olympian Shane Wiskus. He's currently five years older than me. For the sake of clarity of what I am about to say, the University of Minnesota announced eliminating the men's gymnastics program in September 2020. Nine months later, in June 2021, I remember seeing a post made by the official Instagram account of the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers. To quote them, Congratulations to hashtag Gophers alum Shane Wiskus on earning his spot on at USA Gym's Olympic team. I was in shock. I was utterly appalled by the audacity and gall they had in making this post. It was ludicrous of them to be trying to profit off of Shane Wiskus' success despite having already eliminated the program nine months prior. Had they no shame? My dream was to compete for an NCAA Division I gymnastics team. 
the University of Minnesota was one of the top schools that I wanted to go to for gymnastics. However, I was stripped of that opportunity. The University of Minnesota men's gymnastics team ranked fifth, uh, fifth nationally. It was where my teammate Shane Wiskus trained and competed for and eventually went to the Olympics in Tokyo, to Tokyo. My father is a professor in the medical school for the University of Minnesota. My mom got her PhD there. We, our family has special feelings for the U of M. It's a great place. The University of Minnesota hosted the NCAA championships at Maturi Pavilion April 2021. The U of M did well and took fifth in the country. In the fall of 2021, my senior year, I started the recruiting process. However, since the U of M was cut, I had to look elsewhere. William & Mary, UC Berkeley, and West Point were all college teams that were looking to recruit me for their team. In the end, I decided to go to William & Mary. Looking back, the U of M was a very special place to me. Ever since I was eight years old, I went to Cook Hall every summer for the U of M gymnastics team for eight years straight. However, in 2020, there was no camp due to COVID. If the U of M team was still around, there would have been a camp in 2021, which I would have gone to. It was shocking it's in September 2020 to receive news that the U of M gymnastics team had got cut. Then almost a year later, in August 2021, the athletic department tried to sell all the gymnastics equipment to area gyms. However, Coach Burns fought hard for the team and got the support from the Recreation and Wellness Department to let the team continue to train in Cook Hall. Furthermore, I learned that the team has no place to go to in June 2022. I trained with the current University of Minnesota Gym Act team at Cook Hall over Christmas break when my gym was closed for the holidays. It was quite fun and productive. In a mere four months, the University of Minnesota Gym Act team will have no place to go. It really hurts me to see that. What I want to do is persist and testify asking the Committee of Higher Education, Policy, and Finance to please support the student athletes, to please bring back the University of Minnesota men's gymnastics team. I want you all to look into my eyes and please assure me that you really care about the students and our futures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Our final scheduled testifier is Mr. John Roethlisberger. <clears throat> Please identify yourself for the record and uh, you can begin your testimony. Whew. I'm John Roethlisberger. I'm a Minnesota gopher. <laughs> I'm an alumni and a former student athlete at the U and, uh, and uh, a gymnast, obviously. And first of all, I just want to thank uh, Chairman Rarick, the senators, for allowing us to be here today. It means a lot to us. It really, truly does. And this isn't just about a gymnastics team, a track team, and a tennis team. This is much bigger than that. I wouldn't be here right now if it was simply about those three teams. This is about a much bigger problem in college athletics. It's about an unsustainable model of college athletics that needs somebody to fix it. And before I get to that point, though, I, I want to talk about a little bit of my experience and in, in the process of how we got here. And, and just a, a, a little bit about the, the agenda of the University of Minnesota and how it really flies in the face of what they said their reasons were for getting us to this point. I also had a, a telephone conversation with Athletic Director uh, Mark Coyle after he made the announcement, but before the regents had a chance to vote on his proposal. And, and like Anne Marie described, my phone call was also a check the box moment for Mark Coyle. He didn't want me to get in a situation like this, for example, and say, I called Mark Coyle and he never called me back. So he checked that box, which is fine. And he told me on that call, he said, John, I am so sorry. We had no other choice. We looked at this from every direction we could. We tried to find another option, but there just wasn't another option. And to say that hard, that's hard to believe, and I'm, I'm going to be kind here and, and just say that that's hard to believe rather than saying he was lying to me. <laughs> you know, especially when you look at, for example, the Regents meeting where they were to have the vote on Coyle's proposal to drop four sports. That miraculously, as Anne-Marie described, 
they found a way to save outdoor track, which there's an irony there. As I was walking into the, the Capitol today and the wind chill is about negative 20, I thought to myself, wow, Minnesota doesn't have an indoor track team. <laughs> I bet they'd love to have one now. But they solved the problem that Mark Coyle told us that he had by, by dropping three sports, which is great. However, that brings me back to his original statement that I assumed that he said that he and I assume lawyers from the University of Minnesota and administrators had done everything they could to avoid dropping four sports. Yet, when it came down to solving his problem that he said he had, he changed his proposal and he only dropped three sports, which makes me wonder, did he really do everything he could to, to save as many sporting opportunities as he could? Because if he was trying to save the opportunities, wouldn't he come to that meeting with as few sports on the table as he possibly could have? Wouldn't he hold back that track team as long as he possibly had to at all costs? You know, it, it leads me to the, the assumption, and I have a hard time finding any other reasoning other than either he really didn't do everything he said he could do to save those sports teams, or he wasn't trying to save those sports teams, or maybe he just wasn't competent enough to find a way to save them that the raise that he just received would indicate that he is. Because I refuse to think that they actually did everything they could. And it makes me wonder, how many of those teams really did they need to drop? Because apparently they didn't really need to drop outdoor track. On the same call, I asked Mark Coyle, I said, if it's a budget reason, why don't you consider tr uh, trimming the budgets of these programs down to the bare necessities? Just give them just the basic necessities they need to survive as an athletic opportunity for our children. And his answer to me was, it didn't fit his model. And the irony of that, again, is that in order to get his proposal through, to cut at least three sports of the four that he wanted to cut, he added back outdoor track. And just ask an expert in outdoor track, how much of a competitive model is just having an outdoor track team? Again, he could have shedded these, these budgets down to the bare minimum, given us a chance to, to raise money to support these programs. And then maybe down the road, the budget would be different at the University of Minnesota, and we would have saved dozens of opportunities for the youth in this state. Didn't want to do it because it didn't hit, fit his model, which I'm sorry, that rings hollow to me as well. Before I got off that call with uh, Mark Coyle, I said, why didn't you reach out to the community? Why didn't you reach out to these specific sports, to the alumni, to the boosters, the people that are invested in these programs and say to them, hey, here's the problem we have. Here's where we need to get to. And I need you to help me save these. I need you to help me find a way to keep these programs. And I will never forget his response. It went just like this. It was great talking with you, John. The call was over. Here's the truth about Mark Coyle's non-answer to my question. He didn't want to do those. He didn't want to reach out to the very people that could save the program because he did not want to find another solution. Prove me wrong. Find me one thing that Mark Coyle and anybody else, for that matter, who was involved in this decision did to actively try to save these programs. Find one. Anne Marie alluded to what an administration could do if they really do want to solve a problem and save a program. 2002, 2003, they tried to drop men's and women's golf and, and gymnastics. The administration said, here's the problem. Here's what can be the solution. And by gosh, that community did it. It was one of the most amazing things that I have seen. There was a telethon. There was a pep rally in the Mall of America, which the marching band from Minnesota and we saved those programs. Furthermore, I ask you, what does the university do or the athletic department do whenever they need something? What is the first thing they do when they want to endow something, save something, build something? For example, a new outdoor track or a multi-million dollar student athlete center. What's the first thing they do? They reach out for help. They reach out for money, right? They ask the community, the businesses, the alumni, the boosters, the corporations, and of course, the state of Minnesota, right? 
They explain their need, and then they ask for help every single time. In fact, I do believe that just happened here last week. Am I correct? <laughs> for more than a combined 300 seasons of athletics. Think about that. These, these sports have combined for more than 300 years of existence at the University of Minnesota. These three programs have done nothing but honor the University of Minnesota and the state of Minnesota on the field of play, in the classroom, and in the community once they graduate. They have represented everything that this university and this state strive to be, literally. They have created the doctors and the developers and the teachers and the engineers and the coaches. They have created Big Ten champions, NCAA champions, and yes, Olympians. They have gone out in the community and changed this state and changed this world. It is undeniable. No one dare argue that they haven't. Yet, this athletic department that is so quick to implore this community to help when it needs something did nothing of the sort when it came to saving these opportunities. The reason is, I believe, they did not want to save these programs. They absolutely could have. Don't let them lie to your face. They absolutely could have saved these programs. If they had put the time and effort that they put into cutting these programs, into saving these programs, unfortunately, I would never have had a chance to meet you guys here today because we would be competing right now. That is a fact. And if there's still a question about the motivation of the University of Minnesota and the athletic department on this, ask why, after multiple requests to the athletic department and the regents to speak to them, to be part of the solution, we wanted to do the heavy lifting. But after multiple requests, we've been denied. Why would the university try to cancel this hearing? They tried to cancel this hearing. That boggles my mind. And why, when they were here last week asking for almost $1 billion, if they truly believed they had a Title IX problem, and they truly valued athletic opportunities for all of our children and grandchildren, why, in that huge request, did they not have a tiny line item, for example, to add a women's wrestling program? If these are valuable, that is something that they could have done. Title IX problem, gone. <laughs> and the, the thing that's hard for me is I, I ask myself, why are we fighting them on this? It doesn't make any sense to me. We should be fighting this problem together. We should be here. We should have come to you together. Mark Coyle and Joan Gable should have invited us here and said, hey, these, these opportunities are way too valuable. We can't lose these. State of Minnesota, help us. Work with us as a team. The ironic part of that is if we don't win, everybody loses. Everybody. So here we are. That's the process that got us here. I think there's little question in my mind that the motivation and the agenda that they have does not match what they've said publicly. It doesn't. It, there's, I don't see how, given everything that they've done and, and the inconsistency of what they've said and acted, would indicate otherwise. But, but now we're here we are. And, and our push with the regents and the university was never to get them to just say, all right, John, here's your programs back, rubber stamp the budget, and we walk if, off into the sunset. That's never been what we wanted to do. We didn't want the easy way out. We said, look, you can bring these programs back that doesn't solve the problem. We want to be part, an active part, of solving the problem because there is a problem in college athletics. The model as we know it in college athletics is broken. And that is the one thing on that phone call with Mark Coyle that we agreed on. He even acknowledged that, yes, the college model as we know it is broken. There are fewer athletic opportunities while athletic department budgets like ours at Minnesota have exploded over the last couple decades. For a $120 million athletic department budget like the one we have, we should not be cutting sports. We should be adding sports. I've always contended that to truly have an athletic opportunity for a young child, for a high school senior graduating and going to college, to truly have an athletic opportunity at its very core, at its very essence, you needed two things. You needed a coach 
and you need a place to train, and you have an athletic opportunity. That's why I asked him to cut the budgets, because I knew. I knew the value of an athletic opportunity. I knew he'd still have it. I've been around Minnesota sports since I was born. My dad was the gymnastic coach at the University of Minnesota for over three decades. And by the way, he was one of the best coaches of any sport to set foot on that campus. I'm proud to say. I literally grew up on that campus. And I have had a chance to see college sports in a very unique way. And I'm going to encapsulate this as clearly as I can. College sports has become an unwinnable arms race. And even with massive budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars, it will continue to offer fewer opportunities for our youth. And that hundreds of million dollars will not result in more wins, and it will not result in more championships unless people like us do something about it. Because here's the thing. Athletic directors, like the one we have and across the country, they don't have the resolve to tackle this problem. And more importantly, they are not incentivized to do so. Mark Coyle is a great example. He just cut three successful sports from the University of Minnesota. He tried to cut four. And I'm sure he's very disappointed about that. But less than a year, two years later, he was given a raise and an extension. To me, it's pretty clear what the playbook is. And Mark Coyle, in his defense, he's playing it exactly how he was incentivized to do so. Ironically, you know, within that, that realization that college sports is broken, to me, and maybe foolishly, I really believe that, you know what, this is Minnesota, though. This is, this is different. This is a national problem, but this is Minnesota. Minnesotans are different. We are bred to solve this problem problem. And as I was writing letters to senators and, and regents and the athletic director, I'm writing and I'm so proud of myself. I'm like, yeah, they're going to read this. There's no way they're going to say no. We want to help. This is Minnesota. We're going to solve the problem. I really, truly believe Minnesota can be the genesis to solving this larger problem. You know, 50 years ago, 50 some years ago, there was a problem with female participation in collegiate athletics. And then Title IX was created and female participation has grown significantly since then. And that's very near and dear to my heart because my sister was an Olympian. She's a gymnast. She was the first ever individual NCAA champion to come out of the University of Minnesota. I'm super proud of that. And I'm probably more proud of that than she is, to be honest with you. And I don't want to compare this and say this is the same as women struggle to get a foothold on collegiate athletics. But this is a new crisis in collegiate athletics. And this is going to affect men's and women's opportunities. This is going to for, uh, affect the opportunities for our youth. And I want people to look back in 50 years. And I'd love to be alive in 50 years to look back. And I want them to say, wow, look at all of these opportunities for our children to go and participate in collegiate athletics. And I want somebody old like I would be at that time to turn and say, you know, you know how this started. You know where the genesis of this moment came, where we had 40 athletic opportunities at the University of Minnesota? It started in the state of Minnesota, and it started at the University of Minnesota. Maybe I'm delusional. Maybe I'm full of delusional grandeur. But I really, I believe. I believe in the state, and I believe that that really can happen. We have alumni, boosters, supporters, and maybe most importantly, we have parents of youth in this sport that are ready to devote their time, their ideas, their energy, and their money to solving this problem. We have a vision of what could be. And I truly believe Minnesota is the place to make that happen. You know, has anybody wondered, you know, why the president who presented their case last week right here for a billion dollars, much of which is designed to attract talent and, and amazing people to this university who will be a valuable part of the community once they graduate. Yet, at the same time as they're asking for money to attract these talented, amazing people, they are cutting the programs that have done that very thing for more than a century. It boggles my mind. How do you explain this? And I hope that you guys aren't, you all aren't afraid to ask that pointed question. And I hope at the very least it gives you pause. You know, I grew up destined to be a gopher. No doubt about it. 
I made three Olympic teams and I represented our country, but more importantly, I represented the state of Minnesota. And I'll never forget, after my uh, last Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia, it, it was 2000, the year 2000, and I was outside the venue. We had come up short, winning an Olympic medal. It was heartbreaking, I'm not gonna lie. But I was spending a little time with the local media, the Minnesota media that was there. And I was talking to Tim McNiff, who I believe was with uh, CARE 11 at the time. And I told Tim, I go, Tim, I wanted to win that medal for the state of Minnesota. I wanted to be able to go back to Minnesota. More importantly, I wanted to go back to that campus and walk into that Beerman Athletic Building and say, here, this is for you. Because that's how I've always felt about that place. And I'll be honest, there's thousands of other people, boosters, supporters, fans of that school that are like me right now that have a really hard time feeling that same way because of how this process has gone down. Yeah, I have three boys, and uh, I brainwashed them to be Gopher fans, I'm not gonna lie. I brainwashed them from as soon as they were old enough to understand the words that were coming out of my mouth, I brainwashed them to be Gopher fans. In fact, I sent a video to Mike Burns a few years ago, and it was my then one and two-year-old sitting in a shopping cart in a Target in the middle of Knoxville, Tennessee, singing the Minnesota Rouser. And I want to challenge anybody to cheat, teach their kids at the age of one and two how to sing the Minnesota Rouser, but I did it. We got a lot of funny looks from people in the store that day. They're athletes. And like thousands of other parents across the state of Minnesota and across this country, I would love for them to get the opportunity to be collegiate athletes. I contend, and I've said this for years, being a collegiate athlete is the greatest experience you can have in all of sports. Would not trade my collegiate experience for an Olympic experience, and that is the God's honest truth. The opportunity to be a collegiate athlete changes lives. And the people that have that opportunity go on to change other people's lives. Here's the thing. We need you. We need all of you. We have been pounding on a door that will not open. We've been climbing an avalanche. We can't get anywhere without you. This is the first chance we've had to speak our minds. We need you. This needs to be the team effort that we asked it to be from day one. So we are asking you to create a commission to examine collegiate athletics at the University of Minnesota, to examine this decision, to reinstate, help us reinstate these programs, but more importantly, to help set the table for creating more opportunities for more of our youth in this state and well beyond our state. Can you force them to do something? Not as I understand it, but your influence is undeniable and we need it and we can't do it without you. Thank you all so much. It means the world to me that you've given me this opportunity. If you haven't noticed, I'm pretty passionate about the University of Minnesota and, and my sport, but really collegiate sports as a whole. And Chairman, thank you so much. Senators, thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Testifiers, uh, we ask that you be ready to maybe come back up to answer some questions. You gotta give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and members, I think uh, you saw firsthand uh, as I started uh, speaking with uh, this group, and we see many of them here in the room, uh, and we know there are more online, uh, the passion that is there, the desire to make a difference and to, um, I think uh, Mr. Roethlisberger said it very well. They're not just here to demand that their programs be, be brought back. They want an opportunity to help change the atmosphere, to change the direction that college athletics is going. And I think as we look at this group and we listen to them, uh, you can't help but feel that passion and you know that they're ready to step up and help look at what it's going to take to make those changes. So. Um, I, for one, am going to be you know, asking the university to take a long, hard look at uh, what they're doing. Um, you know, it uh, unfortunately seems to be a recurring theme 
that uh, they make their decisions in a vacuum. They're not getting the input from their students, from uh, employees at the university, from future uh, students, and even here, those of us in the legislature. So I, I know that the university is not here today. Um, they're claiming the, the court case that is pending is the reason. Um, I'm not sure if that is uh, the complete reason, but I hope they're listening. I hope uh, we're gonna have some questions that uh, we're gonna present to them that I hope in the near future they are willing to reach out and answer. And as the request was given, I hope they are willing to reach out to these groups and engage with them to look at the opportunities that are there to change the direction that the uh, programs are going, that the way athletics is going. And um, I'm very glad uh, he brought it up. I was going to ask a very leaded question to Mr. Roethlisberger. Um, Saturday at the meet, he talked about the opportunities there to not only bring these programs back, but to grow and add other programs. And I know uh, between him and Coach Burns and uh, others in these other program areas, they have the ideas and they have the knowledge to bring forward and give the university these opportunities. And I truly believe when he says Minnesota can be that guide and can be the ones known for this going forward, I believe that. And so um, with that, we will open it up to member questions um, for our testifiers. I would, I guess I have one. I would ask that uh, uh, Mr. Madar come back up. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, when, when you heard that the track, indoor track program was being cut, and you knew that there were opportunities at other universities to be able to participate in both indoor and outdoor. Um, what went, what decision making process did you go through to decide to stay at the University of Minnesota rather than transferring somewhere else? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so f at first, obviously, I was uncertain about my future with track in general. I think the University of Minnesota has definitely been my number one school you know, since since I started track back in eighth, ninth grade. So um, for me, I, I felt like a special connection with the school and I, and, I, and I knew if there was a chance for me to stay at the university, then I would definitely take it. Um, at first, um, as you may know, both indoor and outdoor were going to be cut. And um, when they, the votes came out and they, they decided to keep outdoor track, I think I kind of clinged on to, to the hope of indoor being reinstated and um, you know, continuing to compete for the university and stay in my community that you know, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with and comfortable with. So um, I think my, I definitely considered entering the transfer portal as, as my teammates obviously had. Um, but I think ultimately my decision came down to just being a lifelong Gopher fan and um, just, just being um, excited and hopeful to compete at the collegiate level like I've always dreamed about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Senator Goggin, you have a question? Yeah, yes I do, Mr. Chair. It's uh, for Ms. Rogers, though. <clears throat> it's for Ms. Rogers. Uh, I was hoping she could maybe shed some light on, uh, <clears throat> back in 2002, uh, you know, they saved the men's and women's golf and also the gymnastics, is that correct? Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Well, it wasn't me, it was my dad. Oh, so, or how, yeah. did, how did your dad do it? I yeah, say. so they um, they went to him, as John said, they always went back to the donors when they wanted something to happen. And I think the short answer to that is that they worked together with the athletic department. So there's a picture on the, on the brochure from that that has Joel Maturi in the middle, and it was my dad, Bob McNamara, Lou Nanny, and Harvey McKay in the telethon that John referenced. They had a telethon and raised the money. They said, here's the number you need to make. They were going to do it, whatever, and they did it. So, uh, and then that year, that team that was supposed to be eliminated, the golf team, won the national championship. So, uh, the guy from the Star Tribune just asked me, "How did he get that ring?" And that the golf team awarded him the ring. It says McNamara on the side, and he proudly wore it the rest of his life. He was so proud of those athletes. So, 
Thank you very much. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just initially want to say thank you to all of you for being here to testify and for all of you here showing up to watch them testify. Uh, that level of commitment is profound. And I don't need to be convinced about the significance or importance of college athletics. I, I ran track in college uh, 30 years and 45 pounds ago. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that I find challenging is that this is not a new debate or a new concern. It seems like every couple years there's another sport that's about to get cut. And so, John, I especially like your, your, your sense of seeing this as an opportunity to re-envision how we think about the relationship between athletics and universities. Because we can't keep having this conversation every couple of years when it's always the same sports or when these particular sports are always kind of on the edge of being cut. That's not a, it's, it's not a great place to be. Uh, so um, again, I want to thank you all for being here and for your passionate testimony and your conviction and your commitment to making Minnesota a better uh, and faster place. Thank you. Senator Goggin, another question? No. All right. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here, so many of you. And just a couple things. Uh, boy, the, the commitment, Mr. Uh, Rothensberger, is just uh, fantastic. You and your family to the University of Minnesota, thank you and the McNamara family as well. I, I going into the McNamara Center, I always go into that room where there's a wall of PhDs. <laughs> right. And I think, my goodness, what an impact the University of Minnesota has made on so many people. And your family has done that. And John, you have done that through your work at the U. Um, just a couple comments. Um, <clears throat> My background is in education. I was a high school principal for 15 years in a large suburban uh, school district here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And as a principal, I always agree, uh, really believed in the, what I call the AAA philosophy, academics, athletics, and the arts. It makes a huge difference in the development of an individual. And I don't think that stops necessarily at the end of a secondary education degree. I think it continues into uh, higher education and continues for a lifetime in, in making people, the, you know, the special people they are. Um, I was also thinking about the role the university has played in university athletics and throughout my career, and I started adding up and thinking of people. I came up with about 14 people that I hired as a high school principal that were University of Minnesota athletes. One of them is sitting right behind me. And I know what a, it's kind of like a pass it on, you know, that they went through athletics and, and they're passing on their experiences, their, their expertise, uh, their values onto young people. Very important. One of the things that I'm involved here at uh, Minnesota Senate is I'm one of the the two, I guess, leaders, you could say, of the regent uh, process. I'm on the, I'm on the committee that uh, vets the regions, interviews the regions, and makes recommendations uh, to the full Senate on who really qualifies as a regent. And I'd have to say that we've had some outstanding candidates. We've had some great people. And so I really would like to believe that time was taken by the regents in this, and they certainly have the right to on how they vote. But I think one of the things that uh, is so important is that I think those people are committed. I know it seemed to be a close vote, you said. Seven to five, is that right? Seven to five it was a close vote. And, um, you know, that's one of the important things that we do you know, as senators and House of Representatives, we vote on who are going to be the University of Minnesota Regents. And I, I think uh, in the back of my mind, you know, as a senator, I believe that the governing body, whether you're uh, on the city council or whether you're a region of Minnesota or whether you're sitting here in the legislature, that you have a responsibility and that that is you that, that uh, makes that final decision. So I, I hope, and uh, knowing those people, I hope that they, they certainly did a good job in, in thinking that through. 
It's a, it's a really a difficult issue. Um, I know it's important to some of the students that we've heard from, future students, uh, future uh, of our state. So I really appreciate you being here. I don't think you can downplay in any way the importance of the University of Minnesota to our state, you know, as an economic engine, as a trainer of, of future um, generations of people, whether that be in education, business, medicine, what have you. So it's, it's really uh, very important. I think also some of the things that I've heard, I, I've seen and believe myself that college athletics to a degree has been broken because the exorbitant uh, salaries that we're paying to certain sport, sports, um, uh, the game day experiences, all of that, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a thing and I enjoy that. I mean, I've been at the university and, and enjoyed that as well. But I... Uh, I don't have a, a, a vision for what the future might be on this issue, but I greatly appreciate you all being here and offering your testimony, your personal experiences. And uh, I guess at this point, uh, there is a uh, legal issue that's involved and, and that may play out in uh, the final end of this as well. But again, thank you so much for being here. Greatly appreciate uh, your time and, and sharing your story. Thank Thank you, Senator Claussen. And um, I have, I, when I was at the gymnastics meet Saturday, there was a story told to me, and um, I would, I apologize, I cannot remember your name, but uh, would our dentist uh, please head up to the testifiers table? I do have a, a question for you. But um, you know, I think we we've all heard this. Um, the university is looking for the best and the brightest to come to our school. Um, and we're looking for ways to recruit them. And uh, your story was uh, one that just reached out to me as to this is exactly uh, the type of tool that the university can use uh, for that. And so if, if you would identify yourself for the record and uh, tell me your story that you shared with me on Saturday. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senders. Um, wow. My name is Dr. Joseph Ray. I sent you all um, an email um, earlier, and um, Joey Ray is what people know me as in the gymnastics community. I um, had a great career, like Johnny and Brian and so many other gophers. We talked about Clay winning two NCAA, champ NCAA champions that same year that the golf team did when our, our sport was um, saved. I had a great career. I graduated from the College of Biological Sciences. I graduated from the University of Minnesota Dental School because that's, once I got here, I wanted to stay. I didn't, I didn't apply anyplace else. I wanted to stay here. I was recruited after a real great career as a high school gymnast, a junior Olympian um, in, the, in that program. I was recruited by more than six schools. We're only allowed to go to six recruiting trips, but I was recruited by more than six Division I NCAA universities. And I chose Minnesota above the rest of them because of their great gymnastics program, the history, the guys they produced, the guys that came before me, and their biology program. I, would, I was a biology major. I, I thought that was really cool. I, I wanted to study that. And I knew, you know, gymnastics, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be a professional that they didn't have such a thing. I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, work. I mean, not that gymnastics isn't work, but I, I'm gonna have to do something other than the gymnastics. So I was thinking about my education as well. And so um, in doing that, I, I'm so grateful to have practiced dentistry for 30 years in Minnesota and supporting a number of families who worked for me in my practice. Um, and as a result of me staying here, I, I had other opportunities to serve in my communities as a coach, you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of the guys that were coaching at that meet were kids that I coached, and you know, I mean, it's like a whole big family. And as a pastor at, at the church around me, and I've got to minister to a lot of people who suffered from addictions and uh, mental illnesses and, and other sorts of afflictions. And I got to invest in the communities that I live in, like real hit the road, this is where life is. And I, and all of those accomplishments, achievements, and opportunities to serve people came directly from my 
experience as a Minnesota gymnast here at the University of Minnesota, being a gopher, being connected with Johnny and, and Mike and Russ and Brian and, 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 and Bob. And I mean, just, and the camaraderie, the, the, the focus that you're in the gym doing the same thing. You learn to care about people around you. You learn to, and, and you carry that with you. And the sports like track, indoor, outdoor track, um, tennis, gymnastics, these, these kind of sports attract people who are hardworking, they're kind of goal-oriented, ah, I'm going this way, and who actually care. I mean, not that the other sports don't care, but man, it, it's like, and people stay, and they invest in the community. Like I said, for 30 years, I, I served my community as a dentist, and I mean, and I'm just one guy. <laughs> it's just me. And I'm just so grateful. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I had the opportunity to be a gymnast here at the U. And my entire life after that, the impact that that's had on my life and the lives of the people around me. So I just to thank you for remembering that. That was fun talking with you the other night. And I, and I thank you all for considering um, what you can do to help us and, and help kids like me, kids like these guys to invest in their communities, even, even after their glorious careers at the university. You know, sometimes, you know, it's like there's real life after that too. And it is real life. We get to do real things when we graduate from the University of Minnesota. So thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to share what my heart is and what this program and what this university has done for me and, and the people all involved. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, can you oh. share with everyone, where did you come from? Where had you graduated from high school? Oh, I, I went to Main East High School in um, Park Ridge, Illinois, a, a suburb of Chicago. Um, and they, they had a great gymnastics community. I mean, I, but I chose to stay here. And uh, one more. So today when people ask, do you consider yourself to be a Minnesotan or from Illinois? I consider myself a Minnesotan. However, I sometimes like to irritate Vikings fans. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony. Right. Thank you. Um, I have one other person I'd like to call up uh, just to ask a couple of quick questions. He's been so involved in the background. Uh, uh, Mr. Winneman, if you would come up and um, I'll ask the question, then if you would identify yourself for the record. Um, but I guess, you know, one of the questions, and I think it's been brought up, but I know you've really looked at it, but what, do you, what would it take for a dollar figure to bring these three programs back? Uh, well, first of all, th thank you, Chair Rarick, Senators, and uh, for all of our one-on-one -on -one meetings we'd have all uh, so quickly, we appreciate it. Um, and for all of my teammates that couldn't make it here, Hassan Mead, Ben Blankenship, training for the next Olympics, they obviously can't be here. They appreciate it, too. It, the cost is just so low, uh, really at the end of the day. Um, indoor track alone saved $110,000. No coaches were cut. That's like bus trips to Iowa. We have over a thousand, we have nearly a thousand alumni on the men's team alone with the combined team. It's just not that much money. It just, it doesn't make sense when you reduce the women's roster sizes of the track teams and then to justify cuts to the men's teams over such a small amount of dollars. I mean, alumni relations and in high schools raise money like this. Maybe maybe not Melrose where I'm from, but maybe Neen Prairie of sorts to support their team. <laughs> um, to have that, we can do cookouts, golf outings, what have you. It's just none of this was considered. We did it anyway, though. John Roethlisberger mentioned this. My trade, by trade, I'm a fundraiser for a nonprofit, and I set up pledges. Not one year pledges, uh -uh, not like that. We told people, if you can put a money down to support your team getting reinstated, say it all comes back tomorrow, how much would you pitch in? Not one year, not two. For five years, could you put in an amount? So then, you know, you have a couple years to figure out weird budgetary concerns, and then you actually say, okay, we're a combined team, what are fundraisers we can do, all of those other aspects, and even roster management to do that, and we'll work on those together. And track is sitting here right now with $1.8 million in pledges of just 
just sitting that I can't in good conscience tell them, send it to the university because we got back outdoor when what if they cut outdoor next year and you have four more years of pledges with no team? That, that's just not good for my teammates and my alumni to do, um, especially when, you know, unlike Coach Wilson in the crowd here from the women's team, uh, the fraternizing is common. So often we married each other. And when one team wants to support it, the other one might not. But it's sitting here, and that's just for that team. Overall, it's under $3 million, a $20 million loan that had to be done anyway. We both knew $75 million. You can't cut your way down to zero on that. That wasn't going to be possible. Even cutting it in half, we knew that there would have to be some sort of bridge, temporary issue. But we had money. We had solutions. We wanted to come with it, and we presented it. And not being considered it is just bad governance to... To, to respond to Clausen's, uh, Senator Clausen's um, comment on they did everything they could, they rebrat outdoor the night before. Like, why would you do that if you studied everything? Like, we had money even to cover both teams, and now we had for sure to cover indoor. So it just doesn't compute, and things just don't work like that when you have people that want to support teams. And then there'd be no public pressure on it. There'd be no public funding involved in it because we're just going to support them. But you got to give us the chance. But if we can't have a meeting to sit down with it, we'll talk to our elected representatives, we'll have constituents reach out to you, and they're probably going to keep reaching out to you, I'm sorry to say, for the next couple of weeks here. They probably will be keep uh, emailing and calling. Uh, but I do appreciate that um, it's about $3 million what we thought for all three teams, and track for sure covered it for a few years by itself um, for five. And people on the live stream right now might be asking, Mike, do I need to send that in after this meeting or what have you? And we'll get back to those people on it. So I want to say thanks again for the opportunity. If you have any more questions, would happy to be able to answer. I have one more follow-up. I know as we talked about things earlier, uh, we discussed that each of the three programs currently have endowments. Uh, do you have any idea, have you been able to find out what is going to happen with those endowments? Sure. Uh, in the case of, uh, well, we'll start from track first. Uh, obviously, there's still an outdoor team. Most endowments are for scholarships, right? Track has a designated under 13 scholarships for the team. Well, there's more events than scholarships, but that's with an NCAA rule. We can't fix that. So uh, naturally, you're going to have more people than you have scholarships for, just how it goes. There's a, a few million dollars. Roy Griak, if you've heard of him, the coach that was there for 50 years, he does a big cross-country meet in Falcon Heights. It's a big deal. Um, has a named one himself. That one's still going to be active because there's still a cross-country team and there's still an outdoor team. That's, that'll still be used. Um, the other teams, however, um, in the case of tennis, you do need approval to change an endowment, right? The, the money can't be sent to a team if there's no team. So where does it go? Well, you either need to change it uh, to saying, you know, oh, it's for general operating, or it gets refunded. The, the problem is you can't refund it because some donors are no longer with us, or you can't identify an heir, or different people donated it. So normally that just gets given back to a, a department, and it just gets added to the general ledger if there's nowhere that can be clearly shown to do that if there's no team. Gymnastics would be the same way to say, do we rewrite the rules on these different pieces? How do we go about that through? And each team has a few endowments. Um, it's, it's a few million dollars, as well as planned gifts that are on the record if you know a donor would pass away to go sent to this team. Well, if there's no team, where does that go? Well, under the general budget, technically. Um, so all of those things in the back end would have to be figured out from a financial sense. And really, they're just in limbo right now until they get figured out. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that Thank testimony. You. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up on... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a follow-up on the tennis endowment. Um, we, as Senator Putnam said, we saw this maybe would be coming. And so in the early 2000s, um, the baseline board wrote their endowment terms so that if the tennis team were ever eliminated, men's tennis, that that, endow or that endowment would have to be returned to the baseline club. If, and we followed up with the foundation when this, these cuts were first announced and said, you know, it looks to us like our legal agreement says these need to be returned. And they said, yes, that's true. When the object of the endowment goes away, we will return it to you. So um, as Mike said, you know, we can't just put it in any fund. But the way the board or way the bylaws were written, it says that it can be used to support any tennis association in Minnesota, to support tennis in Minnesota. It doesn't have to be at the U. 
So they asked us, we would hope that you would support women's tennis. And we said, we probably won't support women's tennis with that endowment because of our fear that women's tennis would go away too. So we have requested it a few times um, and have not heard back. Uh, so that's the process. But we were told that ours would come back to us, but that hasn't happened. Thank you. So just Senators, any other questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, Senator Rare. Yep. Online. Okay. Uh, Senator Jasinski, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank the testifiers. Sorry I could not be there today, uh, but definitely agree. Uh, Mr. Rosenberger, uh, great comments. Uh, I think uh, what athletics does uh, for leadership in college and, and the things it brings to our, our individuals in our state is truly unmatched. So I think this is something, as Senator Claussen said, obviously the Board of Regents has uh, their discretion on how they think this should be done, but I, I, I'm not in favor of what they're doing and the direction they're going and, and the model they're trying to change. So I think it's something we as this board should think about when we're approving budgets and some of us on, are on uh, uh, bonding as well. So think about some of those things when we're making these decisions. But I, I'm uh, uh, displeased that they're making these cuts the way they are. I met many uh, emails from constituents and uh, phone calls from constituents in my district who have the same concerns that uh, many of you here do today. So. Uh, that's my comments, and uh, thank you for uh, testifiers once again. Uh, some great comments. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Good to see you up and I'm trying to tell. Is that a snowmobile balloon I see in the background? <laughs> so, couldn't resist. So, um, members, you know, again, I want to thank everyone who showed up today uh, to support this group, uh, everyone who is following online. Um, we are going to have a series of questions that we are going to send on to the University of Minnesota, um, mainly, uh, I think, revolving around the idea of where is the university athletic department going, uh, what is it going to look like, and are they willing to engage with uh, stakeholders um, to help guide that path, um, or are they going to do it in a vacuum on their own? So um, I, I do want to also mention, you know, this group has been amazing uh, as I've spoken with them, uh, their passion, and just, you know, seeing some of the folks who came out of it. Uh, it's great to have uh, former Olympian John Roethlisberger here. Um, I was also able to meet with our former and future Olympian Shane Wiskus. Um, they... You know, and that, that, the thing I would like to also reiterate, you know, at that event on Saturday, you know, this gymnastics team, they're no longer um, gophers. And they were not allowed to wear the block M, but everything they wore said Minnesota. They are still proud to be at the University of Minnesota and to represent our university. And that speaks volumes to me. They're, are they happy with the process that has happened? No. But they haven't bailed. They haven't gone anywhere else. This is where they want to be. And they want to work with the administration to make it happen. And I think uh, um, I, for one, and I believe uh, we've heard from a lot of people on this committee and I think in the, the other body as well, that we are going to do our part to help bridge that gap, and to make this happen. So again, thank you everyone for being here. This meeting is adjourned.